The U.S. finished the Panama Canal in 1914 after 10 years of construction. Today, the passage is still seen as one of the most extensive engineering feats in history. The 51-mile-long waterway connects the Atlantic Ocean with the Pacific Ocean, forming a vital corridor for transcontinental travel. Before the construction of the Panama Canal, to get from, the, say, the east coast of the United States to the west coast, one either had to sail all the way around the tip of South America, which was an incredibly long and arduous journey, or people would cross over, particularly at the Isthmus. And what many people don't realize is that the Isthmus of Panama, almost the exact route of the Panama Canal today, had long been a major transshipment and crossing point all the way back to the Spanish Empire. That's Paul Sutter, a professor of environmental history at the University of Colorado Boulder. His current work focuses on the environmental and public health implications behind the U.S. construction of the Panama Canal. Sutter says that the U.S. had multiple motives in ensuring its creation. People had long been trying to get from east to west across the isthmus, but it was an arduous journey. And to have the capacity to move ships through the isthmus was going to reduce that journey really substantially. And it particularly sort of became poignant for Americans during the Spanish-American War when a ship called the USS Oregon, it was just very difficult for it to get back and forth to get from, the, say, the Philippines to the Caribbean or vice versa. And so that was really when the U.S. sort of, from a military standpoint, felt the need to get this canal completed. But it was also always going to be a major commercial project, a public works project that was going to aid in and speed up and increase commerce. To the U.S., the Panama Canal symbolized a new era of transcontinental travel, business, and westward exploration. The man-made passage opened up new shipping paths for goods and allowed for greater global economic power. However, the United States wasn't the only one to hold this idyllic vision. Unknown to some, France was actually the first country to tackle the build-out of the Panama Canal in 1880, but a series of bad judgments ultimately led the European country to abandon ship. The French had made the bad decision to try to build a sea-level canal in Panama, which was going to involve a huge amount of excavation. The second was that they relied upon private financing, and as the progress of the canal was not what financial backers hoped it would be, Panic ensued, and the financial backing of the canal was increasingly undermined. But maybe the most important was that the French could not deal with the public health challenges that they faced during the construction period. And particularly, they feared diseases such as yellow fever and malaria, the so-called tropical diseases. In only a decade and a half, nearly 25,000 workers hired by the French died from disease, including malaria, tuberculosis, pneumonia, and yellow fever. This was a hugely difficult thing for them to deal with, and because yellow fever particularly attacked white outsiders to the region, the French officials were most likely to suffer from that disease, so not exclusively. And it was a dreadful disease, a hemorrhagic fever that killed quite gruesomely. And they were working with an older understanding of these diseases, largely rooted in miasmatic theory. So they didn't understand that mosquitoes were the vectors for both malaria and yellow fever, and that really inhibited their capacity to fight the disease. By the early 1890s, the French faced high mortality rates and private funding had run dry, deeming the project bankrupt. Years went by, and despite the challenges the French had seen, U.S. support for the project stayed steady. President Theodore Roosevelt led efforts to buy the land concession from the French and negotiate a treaty from the newly formed country of Panama. It took years to finalize, but construction finally began in 1904. Thousands of people from the U.S. and abroad traveled to Panama to find work. But who exactly were they? The workforce in Panama was predominantly Black West Indian. And so while a large number of workers did go to Panama from the United States, mostly they were in skilled positions. Sort of the unskilled labor was mostly Black West Indians, Barbadans, Jamaicans, etc., with also some Southern Europeans. There were a lot of Spanish workers, some Italian workers. And so the labor system in the Panama Canal was an interesting one. It was a dual labor system that was defined largely by the currency in which people were paid, whether they got gold or silver. And so there were gold and silver roles in the canal. American workers got paid in gold and got paid more. And non-American workers got paid in silver and got paid less. And Initially, this was a 
system that we might call a national origin system. It was rooted in where the workers came from. While not seen as a fair labor hierarchy in this day and age, still thousands flooded in to help construct the lock canal system. The engineered design would lift ships up to an artificial lake called the Gatun Lake and then lower the ships down at the other end of the canal. The biggest challenge was how to get the canal across a river called the Chagres River, which was in most parts of the year not a particularly big river, but during the rainy season it could swell into a really powerful and dynamic and destructive force. And so getting a canal to cross that river was a fundamental challenge, and eventually the United States would settle on what was a, probably a much more sensible design, which was to build a dam that dammed the Chagres River. It was, in fact, the largest dam on earth at that point, the Gatun Dam, creating Gatun Lake. And then basically the canal becomes a dredged canal in from the Caribbean and the Pacific, up locks, two on one side, one on the other, and into this freshwater lake which boats would then cross and dare step back down to the other side. Unlike the French sea-level canal design, the U.S. lock canal system required far less excavation of the land. But in order to successfully complete this construction, the U.S. needed a healthy workforce. And that meant tackling the rampant disease that had previously crippled the French. From a sanitary standpoint, in particular, the first disease they wanted to attack with yellow fever, again, in part because it was such a gruesome disease. Now, the United States was lucky they entered this construction period in the early 20th century as the beneficiaries of two really important discoveries, one made by Ronald Ross and, and other Italian scientists that mosquitoes of the genus Anopheles were the ones that spread malaria. And so that gave them a way of targeting the mosquito in dealing with malaria. And then the Reed Commission in Cuba at the end of the Spanish-American-Cuban War figured out what a, a Cuban physician, Carl Finlay, had long suspected that the Aedes aegypti mosquito was the vector for yellow fever. Armed with this information, the U.S. re-engineered the region's water collection program to stop the breeding of these mosquitoes and successfully cease yellow fever and other waterborne illnesses. The system also ended up providing tap water to local citizens. While the U.S. succeeded in ending the spread of some diseases, Sutter says still at least, if not more, than 6,000 workers died during the 10-year period. During those years, the biggest killers were actually tuberculosis and pneumonia. But because the Americans didn't necessarily see these as tropical diseases, as threats to white Americans moving into a place like Panama, they were fairly slow to address these concerns. And for the most part, these were diseases of crowding and living conditions. Sutter says that while history celebrates the creation of the Panama Canal, it's also important to note the negative implications that come with completely altering a landscape and the ecosystems within it. What I'm finding in Panama is that while the Americans really conceptualized diseases like malaria and yellow fever as tropical and thus as products of this particular environment, in fact, largely for reasons of where and how mosquitoes that spread yellow fever and malaria bred, most of the problem was environmental disturbance, that in fact it was conditions created by the construction of the canal that greatly exacerbated the prevalence of these diseases. And so while Americans celebrated their conquest as one of tropical nature, in fact, what they were really doing from a public health standpoint was coming to control a set of conditions of their own making, largely for Again, the benefit of American workers in particular. To learn more about this topic and our guest, Paul Sutter, visit ViewpointsRadio.org. For behind the scenes, follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Viewpoints Radio and subscribe and listen to our show anytime wherever you listen to podcasts. This segment is written and produced by Amira Zaveri. I'm Gary Price. Holiday celebrations are often joyous occasions, but they can be challenging for the millions of people living with Alzheimer's disease and those who care for them. The hustle and bustle of the holidays can be stressful for those with Alzheimer's, and changes in the daily routine, large gatherings, and noisy environments can create extra anxiety. Monica Marino, Senior Director of Care and Support at the Alzheimer's Association, has some tips to make the holidays enjoyable. First, plan ahead. 
Prepare the host for special needs, such as a quiet room for the person to rest. If you're hosting, let guests know what to expect before they arrive. Since crosstalk and multiple conversations can be challenging for people living with Alzheimer's, try engaging the person one-on-one or in smaller groups and keep them involved in the celebrations. Marino also suggests experimenting with new traditions. For example, if evening confusion and agitation are a problem, turn your holiday dinner into a holiday lunch or brunch. Find out more tips at ALZ.org. This week is National Influenza Vaccination Week. The American College of Physicians, a national organization of internists, advises adults to get an annual flu vaccine. And it's a chance for even more, according to ACP President Dr. Robert McLean. It's not too late to get a flu vaccine. It's also the perfect time to discuss with your internist other recommended adult immunizations that you might need. Vaccines are safe, effective, and help prevent illness, hospitalization, and even death, especially among adults with chronic conditions. Adults need vaccines, too. So take the opportunity to protect yourself against the flu and find out if you need vaccinations or boosters to protect against pneumococcal pneumonia, shingles, tetanus, and other diseases. Learn more at acponline.org. And that's Viewpoints for this week. Viewpoints is a production of Media Tracks Communications. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to learn more about upcoming shows. And find a library of past programs on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. Plus, you'll always find previous segments and more information about our guests at viewpointsradio.org. Join us again next week for another edition of Viewpoints. Coming up on Viewpoints. Top Dog Foundation is setting a whole new example on how to treat senior dogs, how to value senior life. One organization's efforts to save older dogs and help pet owners plan ahead. Then... I would hope he would still be alive, (laughs) you know. What happens when the bully you wished would go away actually did? I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in-depth on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints.